Hello, everyone. Welcome to the preview session for correctness and debugging. I'm Chen Chen, and this is Le Fan. We will present this talk together. People have different requirements on different types of software systems. What is correctness? It is hard to define without a comprehensive specification. But we do know a number of cases are definitely incorrect, like incorrect outputs, software crashes, resource leaks, memory corruptions, and others. Bugs are widespread in software systems. The number of bugs increases quickly as the code base's size increases. This inevitably increases the burden of software development. Bugs appear both at in-house testing and release code. Take Microsoft applications as an example. It has 10 to 20 bugs per thousand lines of code during the in-house testing. However, even with through testing, bugs still remain in the release products, reduce a half bug per thousand lines of code. To fix these bugs, patches are common in large systems. Linux kernel gets more than 10,000 patches per version. Apache receives around 15 patches every week. Bugs are costly. It would cause service outage, security vulnerability, medical crisis, and so on. These typically cause the loss of money and information, or even deaths of people. Software correctness is a long-studied pro problem. Researchers have designed a wide spectrum of techniques to detect and fix bugs in different stages of software development and deployment process. In the development phase, formal verification and static checking are two of the typical approach to detect bugs and offer some level of correctness guarantees. Then software goes to the next step, testing with a set of design software inputs. There are many techniques about how to generate test inputs. Bus testing is the main technique that is covered by this year's papers. Testing cannot guarantee to expose all bugs. During runtime, logging, dynamic checking, and failure prevention techniques are to detect, diagnosis, and handle bugs. Finally, bugs that manifest at runtime to diagnose and fix as part of software maintenance. In the next few slides, we will give you some brief background in these key techniques following these four stages. After that, we will give you an overview of the five papers in this session that represent the state of the art of some of these techniques. First, let's start with static checking as development stage. After implementing a program, a widely used process in industry is code review. During a code review, people look at the code to find anti-patterns that might suggest bugs. To automatically do this, we can replace human code reviewers with compiler. We let compilers scan through the code and find IT patterns. Different bug patterns will lead to different static checking tools. Lots of works have been done in this area. Some looks for dereferencing null pointers, some looks for renaming errors in copy-pasted codes, and some look for concurrent bugs by analyzing correlations between variables accessed in the code. Static checking is good in a lot of ways. First, it has good scalability. Normally, the static checking tool only needs to do a linear scan of the code, which makes this technique suitable for very large systems. Second, locating the bug is easy using this technique. Once we find the bug, we know exactly where it is and can tell that to developers. However, this technique is limited to specific bug patterns. If a bug is caused by some unknown pattern to us, we couldn't apply this technique uh, at the first place. Secondly, since we don't have runtime information to confirm what we found is indeed a bug, we may have some false positives in our findings. Besides static checking, another option at development stage is formal verification. Let's go back and see the program's behavior. Given a program, at runtime, its behavior is determined by its input data, the environment that may affect the program, and the order between events, which we call interleaving. We can be general and treat all of these as input. Given a specific input, we look at the program's behavior. The behavior can be correct or incorrect based on the specification. If we have a way to say that the program is correct with all possible inputs with regard to, the, uh, to a correctness specification, we call this way formal verification. The first way to do formal verification is model checking. 
which means that we treat the program as a state machine and iterate through all possible states to make sure the program behaves correctly. There are two ways to do model checking. The first way is to explicitly visit every possible state. This means that we actually run the program and build the state graph on the fly. An example is CMC, which checks the correctness of C programs using the, such method. Another way is symbolic model checking. Such model checkers represent the program's behavior under different inputs with symbols. The correctness of the program is then represented with a Boolean expression with regards to these symbols. Then we send the expression to a solver to see whether it is satisfiable. An example of this is CBMC, which is used to check C or C++ programs in this way. The issue of this method is the complexity of visiting all states grows exponentially with the size of the program. Therefore, for large and complex systems, it is often hard to model check them. Another way to do formal verification is to prove the program like proving a theorem. Several systems are proved in this way. For example, the SEL4 kernel and the FSCQ file system. To prove like this, first, we need to define the program's behavior mathematically. Next, we also need to define the correctness specification mathematically. Finally, we send both to a theorem prover, for example, COG, to determine whether the correctness specification holds true. There are some disadvantages proving programs in this way. Describing the system mathematically can take huge manual effort. It often happens that the size of the proof is several times to the size of the program. Second, there may not be an easy correspondence between program behaviors and mathematical statements. There is a gap that requires developers to fill in. Intelligence is needed to figure out a way to specify program so that the theorem provers can understand it. Next. <clears throat> now the software goes in next step, testing. During testing, we fit an input to the program, ask the program and checks if the execution is correct or not. If not, a software bug is exposed. Unlike verification, testing does not and cannot cover the entire input space. The challenge is how to increase the chance of getting bug triggering inputs. In past years, symbol execution is a popular testing approach to get test input. It reasoning from code structure, data dependency, and control flow. Suppose we want to fail this assertion. First, we use symbolic execution to get two path conditions related to this code line. Then these conditions are fed into constraint solver to get a concrete solution. Now we know when x equals 11 and y equals 12, the assertion would fail. This approach is effective, particularly on small software. However, it is too expensive for large systems. To solve this problem, first testing appears. It randomly generates test inputs and saves time for code analysis. Different from symbolic execution, it now works in a loop. After executing a test, it collects and processes feedback. Based on the feedback, it applies random mutation on the input C to get a new test input and loop again. During this entire process, the key challenge is how to mutate data. It is even more challenging to mutate structured and domain-specific data. In summary, bus testing has lower cost and less implementation effort than symbolic execution. However, it is challenging to design an efficient mutation algorithm and manage structured inputs. Also, it highly relies on randomness, lacking reasoning. Even with very careful testing, some bugs may still escape to the runtime. Here, we can use the additional runtime information to guide bug detection and fixing. Software log message is a well-established program practice to record this information. It records program status and relevant operations. Therefore, developers could easily reproduce a particular bug and diagnose the root cause. Logs also help to find optimizing opportunities as it provides runtime information and profiling details. Dynamic checking is designed to detect software bugs and volatilities during program execution. It analyzes the execution following bug patterns, including locking and security problems. When a risky situation detected, 
it is able to react immediately and terminate the program to prevent some security attacks. Of course, this approach has its own drawback. It will introduce high runtime overhead of the extra checking. Also, like static checking, it only targets particular bug patterns. When some errors are detected or predicted at runtime, runtime failure prevention technique can try to mask or get around the error, preventing failures like deadlocks, memory corruptions, performance degradations, resource leaks, and others. Now we go to the last phase, maintenance. If a bug is exposed, developers need to fix it with a patch. Software patching is expensive. They have to test the patch thoroughly to avoid introducing new bugs. In addition, deploying a patch typically requires restarting the software. To solve these problems, researchers propose patch management tool to help developers understand patch impacts of a patch. Automated patching to reduce manual effort of testing and deploying. Mm -hmm. On the fly patching to apply a patch without stopping software services. Next, we will introduce the five exciting papers in the correctness and debugging session one by one and show at which stage they locate in the process. The first paper is pilot on the fly code change for Python based online services from UCSD. This paper is about patching during maintenance phase. Updating online web service faces a problem. We want an online patching without service downtime. The reason is that restarting server instances is expensive. This paper proposes Pilot to support dynamic logging, profiling, and bug fixing. It utilizes Python language features, the metadata protocol, the dynamic typing, and Python bytecode. Next, there are two papers about fuzzing. As introduced in earlier slides, fuzzing includes several stages, select seed input, mutation, execute program, monitor behavior, and collect and process feedback. One of the papers focuses on the feedback step. Another focuses on mutation and judging whether behavior is correct or not. The first paper is RIF, reduced instruction footprint, for coverage guarded fuzzing. This paper is from Tsinghua University, Capital Normal University, and Waterloo University. It is, also, it is about reducing fuzz testing overhead of feedback collection and analysis. The feedback collection is expensive as it has to insert instru instrumentation code at each basic block and analyze these collected data. This paper proposes RIF. In feedback collection, it reduces runtime computation through statical analysis. In feedback processing, it processes coverage with different levels of granularity and it utilizes vector instructions to improve throughput. In their evaluation, RIF reduces fuzzy overhead to one instruction per site, which is a huge performance gain. The second paper is TCP fuzz, detecting memory and sentiment take bugs in TCP stacks with fuzzing. This paper is from Tsinghua University and Ant Group. It is about domain-specific fuzzer design. This paper proposes a novel fuzzer for TCP stack, which automatically generates TCP packets and network system core sequence. Testing TCP stacks is difficult. First, the input, which includes packets and system cores, cannot be randomly generated as a valid input network packets and system core sequence have to follow certain dependency. Second, a TCP stack has complex state transitions and are not trivial to thoroughly explore. To solve these problems, this paper proposes TCP first. It uses a dependency-based strategy for domain-specific state generation and mutation. It collects state transitions as feedback to capture TCP stack behaviors it also uses a differential checker to help decide sem semantic correctness. The next paper is titled MD, Effective De Detection of Memory Leaks on Early Exit Paths in OS Kernels from Lenin Wang at uh, University of Georgia. The paper locates at the development stage. It uses static analysis to find memory leaks in the kernel. This paper detects memory leaks in early exit paths. 
those paths are designed to exit from the kernel early in, uh, in occasions like exceptions. Memory leaks are particularly common in early exit paths. Many memory objects correctly deallocated during regular execution paths are not deallocated during early exits. This paper conducted a comprehensive study on early exit paths in the Linux kernel and the free BSD kernel. Several observations are found in the study about memory management in early exits. Based on the observations, the paper introduced a memory leak detection tool that can find early exit paths in a program and detect memory leaks there. The tool was applied to the Linux kernel and find 120 memory leak bugs that were unknown previously. The last paper in the correctness session is Argus, debugging performance issues in modern desktop applications with annotated causal tracing. This work is done by Columbia University and Johns Hopkins University. It focuses on the stage of logging. We may face performance issues in software. To identify the root cause of such bugs, we can, uh, we can collect the trace generated at, uh, during the runtime. Those traces are from uh, are some like separated program segments that may have some causal relations with each other. This paper aims to find the ca causal path in the graph that caused the performance issue. This is a hard problem because we have different uh, confidence level in different type of causal relations. We are not sure how aggressively we should build causal relations between program segments. This paper presents Argus that solved this issue by dividing causal relations into two categories, strong edges that we are confident with and weak edges that we are not sure with. It then uses a beam search on the graph to find potential paths according to the edge weights. With this technique, it was able to identify root causes of 12 spinning pinwheel bugs in macOS, 10 of which were previously unknown. That is all for preview of our correctness session. Stay tuned for the talks of these five excellent papers from their authors.